Well, let's see. Where do we start on this strange story on the restoration of our films from the 1970s? We shot the films on uh, 8mm and Super 8mm film uh, using a little wind-up Kodak camera. And uh, those films uh, came out on reels that were about three and a half inches across and about three and a half minutes long. Those reels sat in a shoebox in Mark Walker's attic for the last 36 years. Um, in 1999, Mark, Michael, and I got together and realized we needed to preserve these films before they disintegrated away. So uh, with the help of our friend Dwight Welch, he loaned us the equipment, we uh, transferred the films to uh, Super VHS, which was the hot technology at that time, the only thing available really. Uh, but it did give us a good quality master uh, of all of the footage and the finished films that we had made back then. A couple of years later, I took this and transferred it to something a little more modern, a DVD. <laughs> Rough footage for Dracula Must Be Destroyed. The other two films, uh, Dracula Made Me Do It and The Telltale Heart, were completed films, completely edited uh, back in the day and shown to audiences back then. But Dracula Must Be Destroyed, our final film, was never finished. So it existed in about 20 of those three and a half minute reels. And of course keeping track of all this footage is a nightmare logistically, so I took each reel and watched it several times and uh, timed the various shots and gave a brief description of what was on each reel so that as I went through the editing process of putting the film back together I would know where to pull a shot from reel 1, for example, and combine it with a shot from reel 14 <laughs> to put together a single sequence. And this is where the computer comes into play. Now the individual frames or, or reels uh, have been transferred to digital video and we can uh, download them into the computer. This is a, an unedited reel showing the beginning and then into the scene. We tried to film as much of the film in sequence as we possibly could to avoid doing a lot of editing. And this worked pretty well. We would rehearse the scene several times and then we would film it. Uh, even from shot to shot, this, this did work out for us. Most of the reels, as they are raw, are actually the individual scene as it is in the script. Of course, there were places where problems arose, and there were a few uh, uh, bloopers. <laughs> but uh, by and large, uh, the editing process was a matter of stringing these individual sequences together and uh, putting in the individual inserts that had to be filmed a little later on. Once the footage has been assembled and edited into the individual scenes, the next step is to record the soundtrack. Uh, we did not record any sound when we made these films back in the 70s. Um, initially, uh, for Dracula Made Me Do It, for example, we uh, assembled the entire film, uh, projected it, and then recorded the soundtrack like a radio show with all of the actors sitting down in front of the screen. Each one had a sound effect that they, that they worked. And that was done on reel-to-reel -reel tape, which was played back with the film. Of course, they were never perfectly in sync, so it was very difficult to get the dialogue and the motion on screen to line up. Good evening, Doctor. So nice of you to drop in. Where's Mina? Patience. Patience. She's here. Why, Quentin? Why? That's not a problem here. The individual dialogue files can be dropped in and synced up anywhere they need to be. So uh, the dialogue is recorded, run through this synthesizer. Uh, this is an example of Dracula. You are most kind, but I must return to my new home. I become quite attached to it during the day. And after it's recorded, it is saved as a digital file, and those files are then put into the editing computer to be mixed with the live action. I found it was easiest to record one character's lines for each scene all as one long file and then just uh, cut and paste where the individual line was needed. This uh, recording device also has an interesting feature that allows 
for stretching, uh, and in this way you can change the pitch and tone of each individual piece. Uh, this was useful for me in creating the female voices particularly. You are most kind, but I must return to my new home. I become quite attached to it during the day. Not too scary for Dracula, huh? <laughs> anyway, when I get the pitch just right, uh, then the machine does the time stretching. I can also add reverb to the voice for an echo effect, uh, and then save them all back down again so that they can be used later. And here in the editor we have some of the literally hundreds of shots <laughs> that I ended up with uh, in order to put together the film. I'll pick one here and place it into the editor. Uh, this is a clip that has had sound effects added to it, but as yet no dialogue. And then the same scene with all the sound effects and dialogue. Mr. Arker, how nice of you to drop in. How do you do? And we don't want any. Wait, I am not a Jehovah's Witness. I am a friend of Mr. Harker. And finally, when all the editing is finished and the music has been added, we have a feature film. <laughs> not bad. But there was a problem. When I had it all put together, there was about 90% of a finished film there, which was amazing, considering we'd never put it together. But that last 10% was the all-important ending of the movie, which we just didn't have. We had never gotten around to filming it. We had the script. We had everything ready to go. We just uh, all graduated from high school, and our little filmmaking adventure ended. So, what to do? The original ending to Dracula Must Be Destroyed uh, was fairly conventional. It uh, took, all took place on top of Carfax Abbey with Dracula falling off onto the Wall of Spikes, just as we had done in uh, Dracula Made Me Do It. But as we uh, progressed with the filming and we liked what we were coming up with and the sort of zany uh, atmosphere of it, we realized that we needed to uh, alter that ending a little bit and come up with something a little more spectacular. Actually, we wanted to make an ending that had never been seen in a vampire movie before, or any other kind of movie for that matter. So, we came up with the idea of Dracula, instead of falling onto a wall of spikes, being impaled on the minute hand of uh, Big Ben Clock Tower. And how do we get Dracula up in the air so that he can fall and be impaled? Well, that led us to devise the Vampire Volley, Van Helsing's ultimate vampire killing machine. Uh, pretty amazing, pretty stupid, but uh, it worked. I had actually built a model of the Vampire Bali. The original was made out of a, a, a spray paint can, and I think I made the balloon over a wire frame with some cotton batting and uh, hand sewed the fabric over it. Uh, it was a very good looking little model, and we did some testing of the model, uh, which is the actual footage that you see in the film. We never actually got around to filming the actual model. Uh, but the test footage survives, and I also made a, a cardboard model of the Big Ben clock tower, which was very effectively lit, and the test foot footage for that looks really good. And uh, we were planning to use the model work, along with a couple of uh, full-scale mock-ups of the volley for the actors, Michael and, and Mark, to uh, have their action sequence in. And uh, then we had devised a way of doing rear projection onto a black plastic screen behind the actors so that we could uh, put the whole thing together and, and we were ready to go. That would have created our, our ending. But uh, for one reason or another, we just never got around to finishing the film. Well, in 2009, I embarked on a little filmmaking journey of my own, uh, creating the shadow animation process that I used to make Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. I wasn't thinking about it in terms of Dracula Must Be Destroyed at that time, 
Although I was working on the film at that time. Once upon a midnight dreary. But it worked really well, and uh, the finished film of The Raven was well received. So uh, when I got back to working on Dracula Must Be Destroyed, it, it occurred to me, since the, the film itself plays like a live-action Looney Tune, uh, why not just take those same characters and morph them into animation and finish the movie? This is the original script for Dracula Must Be Destroyed that we filmed from in 1973 and 74. And this is a sequence of the final ending that we never got to film. So in preparing for the animated ending, I took this script and used it mostly as it was, but came up with a timed out uh, script with a few changes to it that would suit it better to the animation. I then took that script and storyboarded every sequence in the film so that I knew exactly what the shots needed to look like, exactly how many shots I would need. There were over a hundred. <laughs> and that way I could plan for making the silhouette figures and the scenic elements and placing the whole thing together to create the ending. Once the script is finalized and the storyboard is ready, uh, the next step is to create the puppets, which uh, I do with the uh, use of the artograph and uh, various frame enlargements from the film. All of the characters in the animated ending are based on frame enlargements of the characters themselves from the film. Here you can see some of the puppets, and this is some of the artwork that was originated to create the silhouettes. Here the character of Mina and the character of Dracula which are based on frame enlargement of Michael Boyd and Lynn Little from the film. And this is a photograph I took of my own hand striking the pose. Turn that into a black and white image and that's used as the basis for one of Dracula's hands. It's an easy way to create uh, many different postures for the hands just by doing some model work on your own. And here are some frame enlargements of Mark Walker as Dr. Van Helsing. Uh, there's actually a silhouette sequence in the film which helped uh, to create silhouettes for him. This is his uh, inspiration for his close-up face which is taken again from a frame enlargement. Here's Lynn Little, same thing. And this is the autograph, the good old DB300 by placing artwork on a tray inside and then uh, turning it on to focus it loud. Uh, you can project the image down onto the work surface and uh, trace it off in different sizes um, and create the different uh, effects. And here by focusing it in we can get a fairly sharp image of Stephen Rovinsky as James Renfield. This is taken from a frame enlargement from the film. And this is the character face taken directly from that image. This becomes the basis for the close-up head used in the animated ending. This process can take a month or two uh, there's a lot of experimentation, experimentation involved, you know, getting the uh, exact look, the exact correct body feature and form. Uh, and, of course, the puppets have to be able to perform the various acts required of them, so there's a lot of testing that goes on. Since I knew that the vampire volley would have to be shown from several different angles and in different sizes and different shots in the animated ending, I decided to go ahead and make a new model to use for photographic reference, and this is it. You'll notice that it even has a little Van Helsing and a little Ramfield character in it. This model, painted completely white, and then photographed against a dark background like this from every conceivable angle, yielded up a series of pictures which I could then turn into negatives, like this, 
and print onto sheets that I could put into the artograph. Once in the artograph, I could reduce or enlarge it as I needed to create the silhouettes of the volley that are used in the final animated film. Uh, this way, the volley is always in scale relationship to everything around it, and the occupants of the volley are also in scale in every shot. And this is where all the magic happens. This is the animation table as it's set up for the opening shot of the animated ending. This is basically a wooden frame with a piece of plate glass laid in it. Uh, on top of that glass we have just a ordinary white craft paper. This acts as a shadow screen. Then the scenic elements, which are cut from cardboard, uh, cardstock, are laid underneath another pane of glass. This glass with the black uh, boundary on it uh, actually frames the shot. And then the puppets are placed on top of the glass because it's much easier to manipulate them that way. Uh, you'll notice that the manipulation is very simple. The figures themselves are made out of thin black poster board jointed with ordinary brass brads. There's a full range of movement of arms, legs, and head. You'll notice that there are no rods attached to the puppet. Uh, instead, I use these little implements, which are a steel rod with a uh, little eraser attached to the end. And by using that and gently pushing, the puppet can be manipulated without any visible means of support. If you vary the position of the rods to the main light, they're virtually invisible. And over here we have the close-up head of Dr. Van Helsing. He is piloting the vampire volley and his uh, hand of course is attached to the wheel so that it can turn. He has a movable mouth, which is affected by a rod. The eye movements, which I don't have here, uh, the eyes are actually on a separate piece of plexiglass underneath the puppet. And that plexiglass is the entire length of the glass so that it can be shifted back and forth to move the eyes back and forth without any visible means of support. And his free hand, which is used for pointing, prepare to die, is just a piece of card on a stick. The effect of all of this is seen underneath the glass. Here I have a mirror underneath, and you can see in the mirror what you see in the film. The silhouette effect. When I have completely positioned the puppets and I'm satisfied with their movements and with the composition of the shot, I remove the mirror and place the camera facing up toward the glass and it photographs the shadow. And that's how the animation is done. There are uh, several pieces to each of the puppets. Um, replacement hands, or replacement heads in some cases, uh, for the different animation that's necessary. So I keep all of them in their own little envelopes uh, <laughs> so that I don't lose any of the parts or uh, misplace them as I need them during the animation. Here, standing at the ready, are some of the other puppets and some of the scenic elements. Everything is cut out of thin black card so that it creates a silhouette. The puppets are about 12 inches high. Here is Professor Van Helsing. You'll notice that his uh, replacement arms are numbered as they're used in the shots. The same with the Dracula puppet. Nope, oh, there's Ramfield flying overhead. 
And here is the large version of Big Ben that's used. And there's Ramfield's puppet. I don't know where his eyes have gone. And this is an unedited clip showing how the shadow animation is accomplished. With traditional stop motion, the figures are moved a small bit at a time, photographed, and then moved again over and over. Very effective, but very tedious and time-consuming. With this method, the camera is allowed to run, sometimes for up to 15 minutes, while the puppets are positioned and moved, with the aid of the control rods and even with my fingers, which, as you can see, are clearly visible here. If a move isn't smooth enough or goes wrong for some reason, I'll just reposition the puppets and the props and repeat the movement until I'm satisfied. After this raw footage is uploaded to the computer, I simply edit out the parts of obvious manipulation and sometimes uh, overlap the images slightly to create the illusion of continuous motion on the part of the puppet itself. My little signature is to occasionally allow a control rod's shadow to remain visible, just to remind the audience that what they are seeing is puppetry and not just animation. And here is the finished shot, as edited and as it appears in the film. And once all these animated shots are recorded and edited just as the live-action film and joined together, we have the animated ending. The film is finished. You know, I've been asked why I spent so much time in the restoration of our films from the 1970s. Um, I remember in May of 1971, we had spent all of that year in school, uh, breaks and uh, before school and gym class, preparing our script uh, preparing the shots. Uh, finally, school was out. We had everything together. We were ready to go. We were going to film the opening of our big opus. Back then, we called it The Curse of Dracula. Later to be redubbed, Dracula Made Me Do It, a much better title. And um, we went out into the wilds of Fort Worth. We figured that we could film fairly late in the day and still have enough light to uh, make it look like uh, an evening, a, a day-for-night shot. So we shot the entire opening sequence, three and a half minutes of, of uh, Curse of Dracula. And uh, so about a week later, we got the, the little reel of film. We were so excited. We all gathered around the projector. Mark loaded the reel in and flipped the switch. And, and uh, the familiar uh, red Kodak leader ran through. And then... Nothing. Blackness. Total black film for three and a half minutes. We had totally misgaged the light to film with that early camera. And uh, so we had a fairly expensive roll of nothing. <laughs> oh, we were devastated. Devastated. But I believe that most 15-year-old boys uh, would have just taken that as an omen and given up, uh, given up the film altogether and gone on with uh, our other summer pursuits. But we didn't do that. We persevered. We regrouped. We rethought. We were back filming again the very next weekend. We filmed all that summer and <laughs> through most of 1972. And at the end of that time, we ended up with our 35-minute epic film, Dracula Made Me Do It. We made it. And that has always stuck with me. 
uh, as a lesson in perseverance. Uh, and that's why when these films lay in the shoebox and we would occasionally look at them when we got together, I just, it always bothered me that uh, they were never preserved, they were never finished. And so that's why I have spent so long in making the films a reality. It's been 36 years since we made them. And now all of them have been restored and are available for everyone to watch. I'm so grateful to my friends Mark Walker and Michael Boyd, uh, who started this experience and, and were kind enough to uh, let me tag along and uh, learn from them and share in the experience. And so to them, I dedicate all the work that I've done. I know they enjoy it, and I really hope that you do too, because in the end, we made all of these films for you.